Oh, Lord. Lord, bless him, man. <laughs> In America, black farmers make up less than 2% of all farmers in the country, owning just 0.4% of U.S. farmland. It's a confounding reality, given African Americans' historic relationship to the soil. But some farmers hope a newly legalized cash crop, hemp, can eventually equal the playing field. Everybody was worried about the legal aspect. I'm retired from the military. Of course, you don't want to do anything that would mess with your retirement and your, your benefits. One of the challenges with growing hemp is that farmers have to make sure that the crop has less than 0.3% THC. THC is the component in marijuana that can get people high, but stress on this crop can actually make it have a higher level of THC. And if the authorities find out about that, they can make the farmer burn the hemp. The cannabis plant can make more than 25,000 products, everything from rope to cable to bioplastics. But because of its close association to marijuana, it was federally banned in 1937, only to be resurrected when the Farm Bill was signed into law in December 2018. Due to the disproportionate criminalization of black Americans possessing marijuana, Trigg was understandably cautious. Though hemp is not a psychoactive drug, he didn't want to do anything to put his land in jeopardy. If you own a piece of this here, great country of ours, then that puts you in a different category. You're a landowner, you have property, you have something that other folks will loan money against, you have equity. After Triggs failed attempt to become Kentucky's next agriculture commissioner, he decided to take a chance in hopes hemp will be a lifeline for small farmers like him. He's raised beef cattle through Trigg Enterprises with his family for more than 30 years. Though he's all in on hemp, investing about $15,000 on one and a half acres, the Glasgow farmer has concerns about the potential for monopolization among industrial ag corporations. You can't compete. This trickle-down effect that everybody keeps wanting to harp on, and I'm here to tell you there's only two things that trickle down on the farm. It's some poo and some pee. Kentucky's Agriculture Commissioner Ryan Quarles acknowledges Trigg's fears, but says no farmer will be left behind. Unlike tobacco, corn, wheat, and soybeans, where you grow it in a similar way, hemp is grown differently depending on what the final product is. And so say like a CBD crop, will be grown a lot differently than a grain crop or a fiber crop. And so what we've seen is that a lot of small farmers are looking at niche markets or they're able to excel and replicate what they're doing across the state. Austin Wright, a small farms agent at the historically black Kentucky State University, agrees with the commissioner. It's quality, not quantity. Hemp is not a crop that you can just drop and grow immediately. You have to be educated. You have to know the laws. You have to know the rules. You have to know the science in growing. And organic hemp gets a higher return, a higher value. A pound of dried hemp flour sells between $20 and $50, all depending on its cannabidiol content, also known as CBD. Though he concedes it will be an uphill battle, Wright believes hemp can aid in revitalizing black farming in America. Of the nearly 76,000 farms in Kentucky, only 333 are fully black owned. We're losing, you know, eight out of 10 black farms almost every quarter. The industries of row cropping for most African-American farmers is dying at a high rate. And this crop here being that it's new, it is extremely critical that we have it. You better have it. Trigg's son, Joseph Dean Trigg, just 19 years old, has worked the land since he was eight. He says he's tired of seeing his father struggle and is relying on hemp to carry on the family tradition. Do the amount of work that my father and his brothers and cousins have put into it, I don't want it to go to waste. Everybody says, take a chance. Most farmers aren't willing to take a chance. Fill the dreams. When I was three years old, I fell off a three-story balcony onto a concrete patio uh, onto my head and bit a hole in my, in my left cheek. 
and my mom thought I was dead. When Clinton Carter Jr. decided to quit smoking marijuana last year, he soon realized he may have been unconsciously self-medicating for nearly his entire life, following a host of injuries from childhood. In the last six months of last year, I had seven seizures. His longtime friend George McGill recommended CJ try a hemp-derived cannabidiol capsule, also known as CBD. The seizures stopped. I know what works for me, you know, I know what my medicine is, you know, I know what it's made of. You know, it's third party tested and it comes from Mother Nature. Today, they run Comfy Hemp, an online business selling tinctures, solves for hip and back pain, and CBD protein. So we launched uh, Comfy Hemp specifically to market to multicultural consumers as well as veterans. McGill, a former corporate marketing executive, has no illusions about getting rich off of hemp. The American Bankers Association says they are seeking clarity from the federal government on distinguishing between legal hemp and federally illegal marijuana, leaving many banks unwilling to work with CBD businesses. Loan denial rates for minority-owned businesses is about three times higher at 42 percent compared to those of non-minority-owned companies. What obstacles do you think that there are for African-American distributors like you in this industry? I would say uh, capital. Unfortunately, because of the, the wealth gap in the multicultural communities, if you don't have necessarily a lot of already acquired wealth, it becomes a, a very difficult hurdle. <laughs> George and CJ are part of a larger movement of black millennial entrepreneurs who meet in co-working spaces like this one in downtown Lexington. Through history, I kind of saw the, the trials and tribulations that blacks had in relation to farming. I wanted to be you know, involved in my community and how would I do that? No, I'm not going to be like a big speaker like a Malcolm X say, right? So I was like, well, okay. My other angle could be farming. Charles Jones and Sasha Johnson run the online business Simply Made. They work closely with black farmers and make skincare products like hemp lip balm and body butter. The support that we've gotten here locally has been amazing. They view this work as part of a larger mission rooted in social justice and are concerned about how the hemp felon ban impacts communities of color. According to the Farm Bill, which legalized hemp in December 2018, Anyone convicted of a drug-related felony is barred from participating in growing hemp for 10 years after their date of conviction, unless they were part of the 2014 hemp pilot program in their state. This doesn't apply to entrepreneurs who are making hemp-derived products after the crop has been processed. I've had run-ins with law in, in the cases of marijuana. I know how it feels to be treated in such a way over a plant, parade me, you know, Strip search me, all that for weed. I really want to see a shift. I mean, I feel like I have an actual responsibility to be a part of that shift. So it sounds like your hope is the legalization of hemp will eventually lead to the legalization of marijuana? Yes, ma'am. I mean, we're going to see this all the way through. It's a long shot. Uh, we know that when those marijuana licenses roll out, that there are going to be few of them granted to the state. So even fewer for a person of color. According to the Department of Labor, the average age of an American farmer or rancher is about 58 years old. I'm told that here in Kentucky among black farmers, that age actually skews a little higher. That's why they're hoping hemp, this crop, can inspire a new generation and get more millennials to work the land. Pass that tractor on down to your grandson and let him get busy. Lamar Wilson, a software developer, created SunJoined earlier this year. It's a fundraising network he maintains largely online of farmers, distributors, and processors across the hemp industry. The power of all of us working together, it changes everything. So think about it. As a collective, we can have far more acres of hemp than even a large corporation like a Monsanto. Black farmers are an endangered species right now. We can bring value back to them. This is the one time in history that black people, not, when I say black people, I mean African Americans like that come from America, right? Have had access to a resource at the ground floor. That changes things. When you have access, right? When you actually have access, that allows you to have a force multiplier on your ability to generate wealth. What's her name again? Caroline. 
Trevor Claiborne and his partner Ashley Smith are on a mission to get people to think critically about the history of hemp. They are the founders of an advocacy group called Black Soil, Our Better Nature. As hemp enjoys a renaissance, they are determined to elevate its black roots. When North America gained the wealth that it has, it was, at the, uh, it was on the backs of our ancestors. Who are the people who mastered this art that made us such a, a rich nation? And so that would be your, uh, black farmers. Good morning, I called it. In a July Senate hearing on hemp and the farm bill, there was no mention of slavery's role in the history of hemp production. This exciting new opportunity is actually part of a great American tradition. George Washington, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson all grew hemp. In fact, maybe Lin-Manuel Miranda will make his next musical about that. Henry Clay as well. Oh, Henry Clay as well. Thank you, Mr. Leader. <laughs> a long history, a long history. Uplifting the historical figure of Henry Clay, but if you understand the timeline of his career and the agricultural innovations at Ashland. Mr. Clay was in D.C. for 25 years, though there were tons of innovations happening around him. So we have to dial back and ask, who were those hidden figures? When a lot of these uh, innovations were being developed, black people weren't in position to get patents for them. In James Hopkins' 1951 book, A History of the Hemp Industry in Kentucky, Hopkins details how critical slaves were to the hemp economy, noting the words of a state delegate to the Constitutional Convention of 1849, who said, take away slaves and you destroy the production of that valuable article. A recent investigation by The Atlantic outlined how even well after slavery ended, systemic discrimination dispossessed 98 percent of black agricultural landowners in America, with most losses occurring from the 1950s onward. At least one group, Minorities for Medical Marijuana, are pushing for anti-discrimination language to be written into future federal hemp legislation. Not only written into law, it has to be enforced. Uh, going well, how back are you going to enforce it if uh, the so. governmental agencies who <laughs> so are supposed going to... Back to one of the challenges know. that we face. This is what I normally do, particularly in the mornings while it's good and cool. I'll walk out and just check the crop, see how things are looking. Former University of Kentucky basketball star and retired tobacco executive Marion Haskins doesn't share their concerns. In fact, the Greensburg farmer is reluctant to reflect too deeply on the historical context of hemp at all. Hopefully, we moved on. We all exited our family farms. We all got educated, you know, went to the universities, we got jobs with major corporations, and we left the farm. Oh, that's how it's supposed to feel? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If, if it's really brittle, it tells you that the quality's not as good. I have so much confidence in, because I was at the, the, the meeting in Louisville when um, Senator McConnell and Purdue was there, and he promised us in 2020 that we would have uh, our federal crop insurance in 2020. Regulators are working to come up with the rules for the hemp economy. The USDA isn't expected to roll out a plan for hemp crop insurance until next year. I think it's going to benefit every, everyone. Uh, we'll, we'll be adding to the tax base, we'll be employing people. For brother and sister Paul Price and Jan Brasley in Hodgenville, it's also about the dollars and cents. I'm a retired school teacher who has taken up the profession of farming, yes. And you laugh about that. Why do you <laughs> laugh about that? Because I'm working harder now than I've ever worked in my life. While it saddens her that so many black farmers have not been able to hold on to their property, she doesn't view this work as something she wants to pass along to her children. I've committed for five years. Yeah. And after that, I don't, I think I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be almost 70. We have started maybe a revolution, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, other people can see our story and be encouraged that they can do the same thing. We have a uh, hip, uh, this particular variety is called Bay Ox. For Price, a retired government contractor, this is also primarily a business investment. For me personally, it was the money. But he says because he's a black farmer, he feels a particular need to meticulously adhere to the evolving regulations. We are not blind to the fact that we're African-Americans, so there's things that 
we may not be able to get away with it, others can. But that consciousness isn't slowing him down. He's already leaning on his sister to take an even bigger risk by growing a larger amount of hemp next year. We always put no God in it. We're trusting in the Lord and uh, uh, we believe this is what he has for us to do at this point in time.